We welcome you to tonight's event sponsored by Suburban Hospital. We hold this event every year as a way to celebrate your incredible commitment to your health and wellness. For the second year in a row, we want to express our deep gratitude for your openness to this new virtual format. Your ability to adjust to new arrangements and environments exhibits your strength because after all, while senior shape is about building strong bodies, it is so much more. Movement is our medicine. It reduces stress, it improves our cardi cardiovascular health, and it builds our community. While some of you have joined for the first time in 2021, many of you have been participating in senior shape for years. This year, you collectively logged over 345,000 classes. That is a true testament to the quality of this program, which aims to keep you supported physically, mentally, and socially throughout the year so that you can reach and maintain your health and wellness goals. The success of these classes would not exist if it were not for our incredible and inspirational instructors some of which who have joined us here tonight. Let us thank Marilyn Menick, Susan Magenheim, Matt Rendell, and Susan Grant, who lead our Montgomery County classes, and Rosalind Law and Lewis Giles, who lead our Prince George's County classes. These classes would also not run so smoothly if it wasn't for our dedicated and technically savvy volunteer, Nethmi Gunarantne, who ensures that all Zoom rooms are open on time and greets you with a smile. Each of you practices self-care, whether you realize it or not. What exactly does it mean and how is it an essential aspect of your overall health and wellness? Tonight, we have a respected community physician, Dr. Andrew Wong, joining us to discuss how self-care practices can improve your mental, emotional, and physical health. Dr. Wong graduated from Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston and completed his internship and residency in internal medicine at Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, DC. He is board certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine. In addition to his traditional medical training, he has special expertise in integrative and functional medicine with a focus on optimal health and wellness. Dr. Wong believes healing is achieved by combining a systems biology approach to health and illness called integrative and functional medicine, which emphasizes personal, personalized lifestyle and nutritional changes. A community of practitioners focused on healing can assist patients in cultivating a whole person balance of mind, body, and spirit. Dr. Wong is also a medical acupuncturist certified by the state of Maryland, a fellowship graduate of the University of Arizona's Center for Integrative Medicine, and has completed training overseen by the Institute of Functional Medicine and the Kalish Institute. In his spare time, he enjoys running, meditation, yoga, cooking, and spending time with his lovely wife and two young children. So before we turn it over to Dr. Wong, I'd like to just cover a few housekeeping elements. I know you are all very familiar with the Zoom format. So we're gonna ask you to engage in our conversation tonight by using the Q&A feature. Depending on the type of device you're using, the Q&A button may be at the top or bottom of your screen when you hover your mouse. At the end of the session, a link to our brief program evaluation will appear on your screen as you leave the Zoom. We kindly ask that you spend a moment to complete it as your feedback shapes the direction of our future programs. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And with that, we will welcome Dr. Wong. Thank you so much, Kate and Sarah, and thank you all for being here today. I'm really honored to be speaking today at the annual Senior Shape Forum. And as I was uh, talking with Kate and Sarah a little earlier before we got on, I realized that how active you all are and how inspiring that is for me. Uh, I just started this year at 2021, middle of a pandemic, doing my own, you know, getting back into eating healthy nutrition, uh, lost some weight, you know, started to 
exercise a bit more, started with my workouts and yoga myself. And I'm just really inspired by all of you here and just hearing how many classes and how many minutes of exercise and movement you've done, because it is true that movement is medicine. And actually one of my colleagues at work uh, shared this with me a couple of weeks ago, and they were saying how movement actually tells our bodies that we're alive. And it sends that message for body that we should keep going and keep thriving. And I think that this is the message, one of the messages today on self-care and boosting your immunity, because the immune system has signals that uh, it will send to the rest of the body. And the signals are influenced by things like movement and nutrition and mindset and getting enough sleep. And all these things are really important to send that message of basically wellness to your immune system, to your immune cells. So that's what we'll focus on today is self-care for boosting your immunity. So thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to say to add that I'm a really big fan of Suburban and Johns Hopkins Medicine. I've been a, um, after graduating from Georgetown, I did spend about three years at Suburban as a hospitalist, which I worked with uh, Dr. Park and Rohatkin, everyone there. Really um, had a great time there. And then I went out into the community and started with primary care with uh, Johns Hopkins as well. So I've had a lot of experience with Hopkins and especially Suburban. And I've been on staff at Suburban since 2010 now. It's just a really great hospital. Um, I think between that and Sibley, it's just a really great community um, hospitals that we have here. We're really blessed to have that. So just wanna give a shout out to Suburban for all the community programs. And I've done many programs with Suburban over the years um, intermittently. And I think that this is a really great one here, opportunity to talk about self-care. So for, before we get into this, uh, I usually like to do a little slide, little humor here. So um, we can, uh, we can certainly, we're talking about COVID and the virus and pandemic right now. And, you know, we know that we can, we can kill viruses with our own immune system, but we can also be very diplomatic to the virus as well. And we can say, dear virus, please try again later. And so there are ways that our immune system actually gently nudges viruses out. And we can talk about that in a little bit too. I don't wanna to get too scientific into this because I think the focus is really on self-care, but I just wanna put this slide up to kind of uh, draw an analogy between the immune system as really the host defense system of the body. And you can almost think of the immune system as your armed forces. And of course, you know, in the nation's capital, we have many branches of the armed forces. We can have, you know, for instance, the Navy and the Army and the Air Force and the Coast Guard and the Marines, et cetera. And there's different immune cells that serve different functions as what we could call the armed forces. So your immune system basically has two major functions. One is control of infections that kills off bacteria, fungi, which is yeast and things, parasites, and also viruses. But it also binds and gets rid of unrecognized substances, which are called antigens that are considered infectious toxins, or also food and environmental allergens via formation of something called an antibody antigen complex here. So it kind of matches this up like a puzzle and then kind of shoots it out of the body. And the immune system has different, again, different roles, different kind of parts of this quote unquote armed forces here. You have different cells that are called innate and acquired immune cells, and I won't get too much into this, but just to say that not only are there cells, but they're actually different physical barriers that are really important. So healthy skin, um, healthy mucous membranes, uh, different mu mucous membranes, including me membranes in the gut and the lungs as well, and the oral cavity as well. So go to see your dentist, you know, if you have a skin issue, go to see your dermatologist, things like that. Really, really important to keep those lines of defense open, um, uh, you know, and healthy, I would say. And here's another uh, cartoon that I'd like to share often is that um, when a bug appears in the body and presents itself, so we can diplomatically escort that out of the body through this diplomatic immunity. And then we can also create memory T cells and B cells and they will never forget the <laughs> bug so that if they come back in again, then they can escort them out of the body again. So this is again, something that the immune system does is has memory cells and the memory cells will allow us to respond rapidly and um, effectively. So for instance, we're talking about COVID of course now, and you know, if someone unfortunately gets a COVID infection or if they get COVID, if they get the COVID vaccine, there's gonna be some memory cells that are gonna be created in response to those stimuli. And this is gonna protect us down the line in the future. So we're gonna mainly talk today about how we can support the immune system using lifestyle and diet and using what we call in our clinic uh, SMART, this acronym S-M-A-R-T to support the immune system. So I just wanna go through that and we're gonna go through each of these letters of this 
mnemonic SMART in order here today. Now, a SMART approach to boost the immune system is really a SMART guide to healthy living. Focusing on these five lifestyle factors, which are sleep, or S for sleep, uh, we have M for mindfulness, and we have A for activity, which is movement, which I think you all are great at here and very inspiring. And then we have R, which is real food, whole foods. And then we have ties. Ties are relationships with your family and friends and networks and communities. And so I think all these things are really, really important pillars for health. And we can talk more into detail about them as we kind of go through this uh, talk today. Let me just see, I can go to the next slide, I think. So we all wanna sleep like a baby, assuming this baby is sleeping through the night here. Um, so sleep is one of the most important lifestyle factors for immune system health. So when I was growing up and even as a medical student, young doctor, I, I just felt that, you know, uh, sleep, you know, there's not really much you're doing during sleep. You're just kind of resting, recovering, but your system kind of shut down, but that nothing could be further from the truth. And in fact, the immune system is most active at night. So sleep is, an also, is also an active process that is essential for storage of memories, uh, remembering what you did that day. You're gonna remember that better if you slept better. Emotional processing, whether you had a happy event, a sad event, a difficult event, this is gonna be something that helps you process those emotions is sleep. Detoxification, so your liver is gonna be working more at night, your, your brain's gonna be working more at night to detox, de uh, to, to eliminate those toxins out of the body so that you can wake up recovered and, and you know, fresh, et cetera. And then general system restoration recovery, things like your adrenal glands that are gonna be secreting hormones that keep you young and healthy. And so uh, sleep is really an active process, not only you know, you're resting and you're closing your eyes, but a lot of things are kind of happening in the background. You know, I kind of think of it in terms of like, you know, this, you know we, when we shut off our computers and or they're, uh, they're not totally off, but they're in sleep mode, Right, our computers are in sleep mode, but a lot of things are happening in the process, uh, uh, in the background rather, of our computers to keep them nice and clean and running effectively. And that's kind of how our bodies are as well. So um, interestingly, they've done some studies that have shown that one night of shorter sleep, which is basically six hours or less, is gonna reduce some of the immune, uh, called natural killer cell number and activity. And you need one night of uh, much greater sleep, you know, eight to 10 hours to reverse that effect, or even, even more nights than that. But sleep deprivation also increases the chance that we're going to get infected by viruses uh, and other, other infections. So it's really important to get that sleep for immune health. Now, let's talk about sleep and antibody response to vaccination. So uh, researchers have studied a couple of vaccines, so the influenza vaccine, as well as hepatitis A vaccine, hepatitis B vaccine, and basically if people don't get enough sleep, then uh, people, uh, this, these subjects in these studies have shown a lower antibody production after getting those vaccines. So before you get your COVID vaccine, you want to be able to get enough sleep. You know, I would say at least six hours of sleep, ideally more like seven or eight hours, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but that's going to give you a more robust antibody response to that vaccine um, after you get that. So important to know that. Um, there are some integrated functional approaches to sleep. You know, this could be considered, some of these are considered more alternative. These are considered more complementary. These are things that are usually thought of as more natural medicine. Um, CBT is, is fairly standard. And this is cognitive behavioral therapy, which I think maybe some of you are familiar with already. Psychotherapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. A type of CBT is called CBTI, which is cognitive behavioral therapy or insomnia. So if you have any sleep issues and you want to use a therapist that is trained in CBTI, you can go to Dr. Greg Jacobs' site. He's a Harvard-trained psychologist, I believe, and he's someone that has trained, uh, I guess, thousands of therapists on CBTI, and, and I think there's actually some right in Montgomery County as well. And so you can look that up on his website. Now, there's many other things that you can think about for, for sleep besides getting a good, you know, good exercise and movement. Um, and just to kind of tie in movement with sleep, I'm kind of curious to see when, when everyone uh, exercises and, and here, since I think you're all amazing at, at movement, uh, are you exercising in the morning? Are you exercising at, you know, at lunch or in the evening? And, and if so, you know, how does that help your sleep? You know, I'm kind of curious to see what, when people are exercising here. So if you could just, I don't know, are, are people allowed to type this in the chat? 
I think. Um, if so, just uh, if you could just share when you exercise um, and if that helps your sleep. You know, I know a lot of people are walking in the in the daytime, like in the morning, they'll get up, you know, walk their pet, walk their dog, you know, and a lot of times getting outside and walking is going to really help for sleep. That's what I've, I've found, you know, talking to friends and family about that. Now, besides that, we can think about certain integrative modalities, things like acupuncture, things like massage therapy, myofascial release therapy. If someone has tight muscles and that might be, you know, in, inhibiting your sleep, that might be an issue. Yoga, I found really good for sleep myself and meditation as well. Um, so we have a couple people commenting, uh, some days morning walk on cooler days, uh, noon and 9 a.m. Those are great times. And then some of the classes here in the morning and afternoon. Okay, with the last class at 3 p.m. Thank you. There are some herbal products and things that can also be helpful. I think magnesium is my favorite of that list. If you are feeling tense or anxious and you want to sleep more, one thing you can do is take an Epsom salt bath. How many people have tried that for sleep? I think that's really, really helpful there. Uh, you can actually put a little lavender oil in that bath too, and that can really help with sleep. So again, why am I talking about sleep in relation to the immune system? Because the more sleep you get in, you know, at, at that seven, nine, seven, eight, nine hours, the better your immune system is going to be, the better off your immune system is going to be. So sleep hygiene, we can talk about keeping your room between uh, 60 and 67 degrees, although I think that's pretty cold, um, you know, but, you know, 67 seems pretty good. Using those dark curtains or eye pillows, things like that, limiting noise pollution if that's possible surrounding yourself for so calming colors. I think the main thing that I would say on here is don't, don't use your cell phone in bed, you know, try not to watch TV in bed if possible and things like that, because that's gonna actually stimulate your eyes to uh, send that message to your brain to say that it's actually daylight. And so you, you don't want that. You wanna kind of stimulate your, your brain to say that it's actually nighttime and it's time to sleep. Now, uh, this is back to the timing of food and timing of life, light. There's something called circadian rhythm, which you know is this day night cycle. And so you want this gentle bedtime routine. You want to exercise when you wake up in the morning. You want to go to bed when the sun sets. You know, that's sort of the idea of this. You also want to, you know, if you're having trouble sleeping, you want to rule out certain medical conditions. So you may want to see your medical practitioner about this. Um, almost a quarter of people sometimes have, have sleep apnea. And this is something we found a lot in our clinic. So sleep apnea, chronic pain, chronic urinary uh, and gut issues, and, and even mood issues like anxiety are all things that need to be addressed in order to get a good night's sleep. And then hormones, sometimes hormones can be imbalanced and there's ways to balance those to help with sleep as well. All right, so mindfulness. So how many people have been feeling like this person uh, over the past year and a half or so, uh, looking out at this beautiful skyline here. Uh, how many people have been uh, super calm this entire time? I don't know if I have, but um, yeah. So what is mindfulness? So mindfulness is really being present in the present moment and really being present for your life, really savoring your life, you know, every moment of that. And I think that's really important. And, and you know, I think we know that the pandemic has really sharpen that into focus, you know, what's kind of important in our lives, things like taking care of ourselves, seeing our friends and family, things like that. So mindfulness, this idea of being present in the moment of your life, wherever that, whenever that moment is, it breeds resilience. Now, resilience is basically the antidote to stress because we have stress on the one hand, which can be really uh, taxing on our body's mind and spirit. And then we have resilience, which is our approach to stress. It's our ability to handle stress and to manage our energy. And so mindfulness breeds this idea of resilience, which is very needed in today's world. And being aware of your intention, attention, and attitudes in life. So it's really not just a sitting meditation practice like you see in this picture, but it's also during the, your daily life, during your, your work or time at home or time with your friends and family, just being attentive to your life here. So we're going to take a little deep breath like now, right, right now, and this is going to actually help our immune system, which I'll share in a minute. So we're gonna just take a deep breath. If you wanna put your hands uh, either on your heart right here, you can kinda do that if you want, or you can kinda clasp them together, whatever you'd like to do. So you could just put both hands here on the heart and just take a deep breath with me here. I'm gonna count from uh, five seconds in, five seconds out. So we'll say, inhale for five seconds, deep breaths, sending a little love note to your body. One, two, three, four, five, and then exhale for five seconds. One two, three, four, five. We're gonna do that two more times. Inhale for five seconds. 
one, two, three, four, five, and then exhale for five seconds. Two, three, four, five, and then one more time. Inhale for five seconds. And then exhale for five seconds. Now you can close your eyes or open your eyes, whatever you'd like to do. But the idea is just to be mindful of your breath because your breath is the anchor that's going to bring your mind and body back together in order to find that balance. So mindfulness improves the immune system. And maybe I should ask this, how many classes, and uh, maybe Kate and Sarah can answer this or someone in the audience can answer this too, is how many classes uh, that you have, do you have mindfulness classes as well as breathing part of some of these classes? Because I, I imagine it is. Um, you know, um, if someone could comment on that. So mindfulness improves the immune system. How does it do that? It decreases inflammation. So COVID or other viruses or bacteria, if someone has a pneumonia, if someone has a bronchitis, what's gonna happen, there's gonna be inflammation. The inflammation is merely your immune system kind of activating and kind of having this red alert, which is really good to kind of save your life and kind of get, get the bugs out. But if there's too much inflammation, that's not good because then the immune system is overactive at that point. So mindfulness, you wanna have mindfulness to control that inflammation so that it's a manageable level. And it does something called decreasing NF kappa beta, which is a protein that's involved in chronic inflammation and also decreasing what's called C-reactive protein, which is another protein involved in inflammation. And then it also increases the T cell count, which is really, really important for the immune system strength, kind of like giving that strength to the armed forces like we saw in that cartoon in the very beginning. And then actually mindfulness has been shown to increase telomerase activity, which means that you become biologically younger. Your cells actually live longer in that situation. So it's really, really interesting that mindfulness improves the immune system, but also is associated with longevity as well. Now, this is a really complicated slide, but what I would say is that their mind, mindfulness helps balance what's called the fight or flight response. So on the one hand, which I think is on the right side here, the sympathetic sympathetic system. This is kind of more your stress response. It accelerates the heart beat. It dilates your pupils. It dumps more sugar into your bloodstream so you can run or fight or flee. So this is important for survival. But then on the other hand, you have what's called the parasympathetic system, which is the rest, relax, and recovery system in your body. And these are tied together and they're both, they're two wings of what's called the autonomic nervous system or ANS. So Usually a lot of times we're in this fight or flight mode. You know, I think we're all kind of in the DMV area, <laughs> this fight or flight mode a lot of times in, in our area. So how do we get to a balance? We want to stimulate that other side, which is the vagus nerve, which is involved in that relaxation or parasympathetic mode. So if we're all the way over here, if we want to get to the middle, we want to sim stimulate the vagus nerve a bit. And mindfulness is a great way to do that. Deep breathing, yoga, things like that. Um, and so here are some approaches to mindfulness. Um, I'm gonna skip that because just saying that there's some um, kind of data, data that you can use. There's some apps you can use if you want, I can talk about that. But, um, and then let's talk about the actual things you can do. So you can do breath work. You can do the five seconds in, five seconds out. You can also do four seconds in, seven seconds of holding your breath and eight seconds out. And then being present for your life sort of this idea of using electronics selectively and to your advantage, not to your disadvantage. So how many people are addicted to cell phones? Sometimes I am, anyone? <laughs> cell phone is kind of like your anti-mindfulness, right? It kind of takes you away from the present moment. So you wanna schedule time in your day, just like you schedule time to check your email on your phone. You wanna schedule time in your day to practice some deep breathing. It might be breathing sitting in a chair like this. It might be doing some breathing when you're doing yoga or even breathing while you're doing your exercise class while you're doing prayer, while you're walking quietly in nature. You know, the, all these things are times that you can actually schedule mindfulness. And incorporating mindfulness into your daily activities when you're talking to your friend, you can actually be mindful when you do that. And then having a buddy or support system so that if you do a practice, a healthy practice like this, you might wanna get your buddy to do that with you so that that actually will increase the chance that you keep up with that. Uh, let's see. Yes, I, I try to incorporate breathing with the exercises. That's really great. Thank you, Susan. When to ex inhale and exhale. And yeah, the Mindfulness Center in Bethesda. Uh, that's great. They're great as well. I know them as well. They have uh, Tai Chi and yoga. Oh, you have Tai Chi and yoga. Okay, great. Thank you, Kate. 
So some other things would be, uh, besides what we mentioned, Tai Chi, Qi Gong, breath work, have also been shown to decrease inflammation and to modulate the immune system for immune strength and balance, essentially. Gardening, uh, gardening is another activity. How many people like to garden? Um, I know we're kind of getting that a little bit here, doing a little bit of gardening. Um, that has been shown to also decrease stress and improve mental and physical well-being. And then there's types of biofeedback, including something called heart math that we really like in our clinic that helps to balance the immune system as well. Here are some things that personally I like to do. Um, there's something called the Miracle Morning, which is a practice you can do in the morning. Uh, and you can read that book. You can get it on Amazon. It's a great book. I've been doing that for over a year now. It's really changed my life and the way I kind of view things. And then um, I do some apps and things, although I think the classes are really amazing here as well. Um, so how many people like ballroom dance? Maybe like these, uh, these couples in the competition. Uh, I don't know if you guys do ballroom dance classes here, but uh, <laughs> so this is an example of a great activity. Um, actually, ballroom dance has been shown to really be helpful for congestive heart failure. This is a really nice um, activity. It's a whole body activity using body and mind. So this is a good example of a whole body activity, yoga, tai chi, qigong, also examples of whole body mind activities here. So, you know, activity, how much is too little? How much is too much? We know just like the three, be three bears in the oatmeal story that we know from childhood that, you know, too cold, too hot, you want that oatmeal to be right in the middle. Same thing with exercise. You want a moderate exercise, exercise workload that's going to decrease your upper respiratory tract risk by 40 to 50 percent if you do moderate if there's too much exertion then you might actually increase that risk so you can see that there is an inverse relationship between moderate exercise training and illness risk and exercise generally has anti-inflammatory effects as well so acute moderate intensity exercise for about 60 minutes or less in general and i think it's fine to do more if you're as accustomed to that that's fine but basically it's going to improve your immune system. It's gonna mobilize some of those T cells and NK natural killer cells. That's gonna help your immune system kick, all vi uh, kick out viruses and things like that. Um, and then basically over time. So if you do exercise classes and you keep on doing them and you do them in this sort of uh, systematic way, what's gonna happen is the inflammation will cumulatively get lower, which is good. Your immune system will cumulatively cumulatively get um, get stronger, you know, that cumulative effect essentially of repeated exercise is going to be really, really helpful. Um, and this particular uh, journal was talking about specifically for people with chronic illness and obesity, but I think it can be really applied to anyone, no matter how healthy or not healthy the person may be, it's going to improve your health essentially. Um, so this was a, this was really a, actually, and, and I, I don't want to ding marathon runners too much because I really respect marathon runners. I've gotten to half marathon and that's probably the longest I'll do. But um, there is this idea that, you know, too much exercise might be, uh, how many people are marathon runners? Uh, first of all, you can raise your hand here. Um, you know, I think marathons can be really good if you train right and you, you have the proper nutrition and things like that and you're not overtraining. Um, some studies do show that marathon running and basically over exercise is going to increase some of those uh, stress hormones, you know, things like that. It's going to decrease immunity. So again, not too little, not too much, but kind of in the middle, that's where you want the exercise to be typically, the physical activity to be. And it's not only about what's called exercise, it's really about keeping moving, you know, keep moving. It's about movement, not just exercise. Um, you can do this at home. You can, you don't have to go to a gym. You can do it on Zoom here. Um, you can go out for a walk with your friend, you know, uh, this kind of thing. It helps to treat arthritis and pain, you know, um, as well when, you, when you're thinking about functional movement, not just, not just exercise per se. And of course, if needed, you know, please see a specialist like a physical therapist, like a myofascial release therapist, acupuncture, chiropractic, and then different types of activity. Again, whatever you find enjoyable and stimulating is really, really helpful, you know. I've even been doing recently these short seven minute workouts that have been really, really helpful. And I, I feel even more fit, you know, even though it's only seven minutes at a time, kind of going pretty hard there. So dancing, you know, dancing to your favorite music, you know, did that a little bit earlier this afternoon. That to me is a really fun movement, a little uh, work break in the day. And then how frequent, um, and, you know, how long and how intense, that's variable depending on your health conditions. That's variable depending on your level of conditioning, of course. And you don't want to start too quickly. Of course, you can kind of work it up as you go. Um, 
All right, it's a couple other studies on yoga and Tai Chi and Qigong and basically how there's increased production of antibodies for this vaccine with Qigong and um, after getting a flu vaccine rather uh, for people that were doing Qigong and Tai Chi. So, and then again, yoga is gonna increase immunity and decrease inflammation. So there's some interesting studies on that. Um, again, now I think I put this in because of COVID, but basically if you actually have COVID right now, you, you know, moderate exercise would be okay. But um, if you have mild symptoms, but otherwise, you know, you wouldn't want to overdo it, of course. Uh, hopefully no one has COVID here uh, right now. So, uh, and, and, you know, exercise is a great way, like I said, to boost the immune system uh, is, is what we're, the message is here. So the fourth thing in this SMART acronym is really real food. So, you know, there's a lot of nutritional um, diet plans out there, a lot of books, 30,000 people are telling you on the internet what to eat and what not to eat. So what are you going to eat? What are you going to do? Well, I think the safe thing to do is to say, eat real food, eat food that's growing from the earth, you know, eat food that is potentially perishable if you don't refrigerate it, because that is how food was meant to be. And, you know, here's something I made a couple, I don't know when this was a year or two ago, some broccolini with shiitake mushrooms. Now shiitakes are one of the best mushrooms to, um, to help with immune health. So if you like them, cook them in a little olive oil, the broccoli is really helpful as well. And then on the other hand, we have this uh, sauerkraut from Baltimore here. This is actually by a local company called Hex Ferments, which is in Baltimore. So sauerkraut is really, really great for your immune system as well. It promotes what's called a healthy gut microbiome. And we know that not only movement is medicine, not only mindfulness is medicine, but also real food is medicine. Uh, my kids are, there might be some noise, so I apologize for that if there's, uh, if you can hear that, but um, real food is medicine and real food has the ability to improve immune system strength and tolerance and thus keep us healthy. So you see the stethoscope, you see the fruits and vegetables here. This is kind of what we're gonna look at here. And, you know, there's actually a big connection between food intake, so what we eat, and then the health of our uh, bacteria in our gut, sort of this balance between what's called good and bad bacteria, which we call the gut microbiome, and the health of your immune system. So what you eat influences the composition of gut micro, uh, microbiome uh, bacteria in your gut, and then that influences the health of your immune system. Basically, how inflamed or not inflamed, how strong or not strong your immune system is, is going to be affected by your food and microbiome. And so what do we do to, you know, shop for real food for immune health? So you can uh, try to ideally cook your food, you know, get, go to some, um, I know they have, uh, you know, different um, food services that, you know, either cook food, um, really great, great food for you or, or chop up the vegetables and fruits and things like that and meats and things. So there's things you can do, but eating real food, shopping in the perimeter of the store, focusing on colorful fruits and vegetables. Think of the rainbow there, right? Things that are high in soluble fiber that keeps those bowel movements going. And then the mushrooms, like I said before, really helpful for immune health. In the winter, you know, really looking at frozen fruits and vegetables. They're usually flash frozen at peak season. So you're not going to lose any of the nutrient value there. And then proteins, you know, I like various proteins there, but again, you need those proteins. Um, if you think about antibodies, right? Antibodies are are, are you need protein to make that antibody. So, so proteins, uh, wild fish, seafood, grass-fed meats, pasture-raised chicken, beans, legumes, and then non-genetically modified um, so whole soy, those can be all really helpful. Um, healthy oils, so I would consider healthy oils to be olive oil, coconut, and avocado oil, but also there's nuts and seeds as well. Um, and you wanna limit processed foods and processed grains and sugar. Uh, Kate, tell me if it's too loud. I can move my location if you want. So no, 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 you're know. fine. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. So how, how we think about real food in terms of the immune system is that food, when it's healthy, is going to reduce inflammation, which is typically what you want. So you want to balance the essential fatty acids. Now, fatty acids are going to um, different types will do different things, but you, you typically, and this is a simplification, but you have what are called omega-3 fatty acids and omega-6 fatty acids. And omega-3s tend to decrease inflammation and omega-6s tend to increase inflammation. So you wanna maintain that balance ratio. Now, certain omega-3s are gonna be, um, you know, higher in things like wild fish, like salmon. You know, you, you see here some oils like olive oil and nuts and avocados and, and uh, pasture-raised eggs and things like that. And then we have, I think on here, maybe pumpkin seeds, I think is what that is. Olive, so really some good foods to reduce inflammation and give you some of those healthy fats. 
And increasing foods that are rich in plant nutrients, which are called phytonutrients, such as fruits and vegetables, will also have a powerful anti-inflammatory effect and be, have, a, have a really great effect on your immune system. So this is a study in, um, this, this is a study that actually, uh, I think they were eating sort of a not healthy diet, I think, and basically um, in this group of adolescents actually, but then they were eating, um, you know, these berries and polyphenols and, and that really, that really helped. But, you know, if you're eating a high fat, high sugar meal, which, you know, happens, I think to all of us, you know, I think that's just part of, you know, the culture and life and everything. If you add some plant-based anti-inflammatory foods to that, it may off offset some of that impact as well. Um, so I can tell, talk to you more about in detail about that if you like. So, and this is a summary slide, um, foods to boost the immune system to proteins and bioactive components of protein. So, uh, which we kind of talked about before. Um, mushrooms, uh, I especially like shiitake, but you can see the other ones here as well. Polyphenols that are found in fruits and vegetables, specifically apples, onions, berries, uh, like blueberries, blackberries, things like that. Green tea, herbs and spices. I like things like oregano, thyme, basil, turmeric. Uh, sulforaphane is found in broccoli, but especially broccoli sprouts, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts, things like that. Cruciferous vegetables. And then foods that are high in soluble fiber boost something called SCFAs, which is short chain fatty acids. That's a, that again is going to boost your gut microbiome and it's gonna strengthen your immune system. So beans, apples, pears, apricots. You see that these are all whole foods here. Uh, you, can, you can read the list here. Um, but these are all foods that are gonna nourish your gut, which will then nourish your immune system essentially. And then finally ties. So relationships are actually really, really important. So, um, you know, we don't think about relationships often in terms of health in the clinic. You know, this is not something that we think about often, but you know intuitively that they're really important. So I wanna talk a bit about relationships, which is ties, which is the T in SMART, S-M-A-R-T. Relationships profoundly affect health. So in 1938, during the Great Depression, scientists began tracking the health and longevity of 238 um, second year Harvard students. And the people that were most satisfied, and then they kind of tracked them year after year, decade after decade, the people who were most satisfied in the relationships at age 50 were them, which, you know, age 50 were the healthiest at age 80. So if you want to look at this TED talk by Dr. Uh, Robert Waldinger here, what makes a good life lessons from the longest study in happiness, very fascinating TED talk. You can look at that online um, after this, if you'd like. Um, relationships profoundly affect health. And um, actually, can I go back? Yeah. So according to this TED talk, and this is really mind blowing to me, you know, having gone through medical school and having spent so much time talking about hypertension and smoking and losing weight and exercise and everything like that. Uh, you know, what, what this study found was actually that relationships, your relationships are the best predictor of your health above all those other things, which are also really, really important too, by the way. But um, so, th so that, that is really, really important. So healthy relationships, healthy immunity, couples with healthy relationships have 35% fewer illnesses. Chronic relationship stress in adults is consistently associated with decreased and, and decreases in natural killer cell cytotoxicity. That means they'll kill viruses less effectively, essentially. Lower antibody titers to the flu vaccine and decreased pr proliferation of immune cells like B cells and T cells. So again, trying to make that heart with your friends and family there, have those healthy relationships, you know, build those relationships because that's going to build your immune system. And then this is a really great study from Belgium. So Belgian researchers studying 670 people that are ages two through 86, they found that living together was associated with similar gut microbiomes, as well as similar types and activities of immune cells. So once people started living together for 40 years, then their immune systems started to become like each other. How many people, um, how many people have heard this saying, like, you know, when you're married to someone, when you're with someone for a long time, you start looking like each other, right? Anyone? Um, so we know that, that this could be something. Yep, Sarah's raising her hand. Um, and so the interesting thing about the study was that not only, not only is that, you know, that kind of folktale, okay, we start looking like each other, but it's also the immune system start looking like each other too. So who you live with impacts your immune system. So we'll talk about um, hugs, you know, hugs stimulate the thymus gland, T for thymus. So the thymus gland makes your T cells, which are your main cells that are really important for immune health. 
they reduce the stress hormone called cortisol and they balance the nervous system. Laughter increases the natu those natural killer cell um, counts and, and activities and antibody levels. And then sexual activity, whether it's couples, whether it's self-pleasure, these are all things that actually have been shown to help the immune system actually. Um, so, you know, these things are really important to have a relationship um, with, with your loved ones, really, really important. What about a relationship with yourself? Self-esteem, having an emotional immune system, a, a healthy emotional immune system. Low self-esteem is tied to chronic stress and anxiety, which can tax the immune system. So how you think about yourself affects how your immune system works in your body. So this is what I put in, and this is the, um, a stadium during the pandemic, you know, it's kind of empty here, but you really want it to be more like this bar here. Not that I am um, promoting heavy drinking or anything like that, but this is just an example of people cheering for the baseball team. You know, this is the Washington Nationals or Baltimore Orioles or pick your team, you know, but always cheer for the home team and just imagine the home team is you. And you want to find people that support you, support the home team, whether it's in person or online, find a supportive group for you and that's going to support and build your immune system. And then finally, connecting in nature, and this is a picture of the cherry blossoms here. So connecting in nature, we want to get outside. So the Environmental Protection Agency estimates that we spend, and this was before COVID, 93% of our time indoors. And so now I think it's probably more than 95% of the time, but how does outdoors nature time affect the immune system? So A, we definitely want to recommend to take in more natural light. Um, getting outside, you know, especially in the morning would be nice. Limiting artificial light, you know, so getting outside. When we have to be inside, working close to a window, taking breaks to walk outside will also really help a lot. And then it'll help you sleep better too when you get outside. Now in this time of social distancing, um, this may be a time to experience the therapeutic effects of what's called forest bathing. And forest bathing is, um, there's a Japanese term for this, which is called Shinrin Yoku, which is interesting. And so this idea is you're just going out hiking or in the forest. It's in the quiet place. You know, it's not really a place where there's tons of travelers necessarily, but you know, you're just, you might be in a park, you know, you might be in a, a like the Great Falls National Park, you know, or something like that. You might be in your local neighborhood park, but you're, you're doing this forest bathing and that's going to actually increase your, your immune cell activity. Again, it's gonna improve immune system recovery and it also decreased stress. So gonna decrease that cortisol level. So nature time does these really salutary, phys physically salutary, physically beneficial um, effects on your immune health, essentially. And you might wonder, well, how much time do I need? You know, um, so actually Scottish researchers actually asked this question and they reported that uh, people felt that um, they, were, they were feeling their best when they got at least two hours a week total out a week in parks or trails or in wilderness or nature areas. And that was their considered their key RX prescription dose of nature for self-reported health and well-being. So, you know, that would be 30 minutes, um, uh, four times a week, you know, things like that. I think this study specifically meant, you know, not necessarily walking around your neighborhood on the sidewalk, but more like going to an actual park, like you kind of see in this picture. Um, but, you know, do what you can, right? That's basically. And then um, the other thing is you want to vary your temperature. So you actually don't want to be in a, in a closed air conditioned, you know, bubble for 24 hours. You know, you want to actually get outside. You want to have the wind blown on your face. You want to have some hot and cold to some moderate degree. So that creates what's called a hermetic effect, which makes your immune system more nimble and resilient towards challenges. So exposure to vari variable temperatures, let's say, okay, there's a hurricane or there's a, a you know, big rainstorm, you can't get outside or you know, don't wanna get outside, how are you gonna expose that? So you're gonna, you're gonna um, maybe change the dial in your AC, you know, maybe you take a little bit of a hot shower and a cold shower and you might vary that a bit. And that's one way you can do it indoors as well. All right, so we get to take home points and practical tips. And please, uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free, because I know, um, yes. Um, and so, I wanted to just bring this up and I hope this is helpful. There are some overview to things to how to approach sort of prevention of COVID and how to decrease inflammation and things like that. So I don't wanna to get too much into detail on this, but I'll just kind of put this on here to say that there's certain, there's certain nutrients that can be really helpful and there's some foods here because I don't think it's all about supplements. I think it's all about foods too. 
So it's different foods that you can see here. A lot of these uh, green, uh, orange, and red, uh, you know, um, fruits, vegetables, peppers, things like that, juices, really high in vitamin C. Vitamin C does have an antioxidant effect, um, which will reduce inflammation, but it also promotes what's called endothelial stability, which helps your blood vessels, helps them to stay open, helps them to stay flexible. And it also is helpful to eliminate microbes as well. Zinc is another big one. It does suppress um, autoimmunity, which is really good. It's needed for T cell to build those T cells up, which is really helpful for your system. It also suppresses, they've been shown in studies, it does suppress SARS-1. So we know that from research from SARS-1, this is not SARS-2, but it is SARS-CoV-1. And then here's some foods here. Um, oysters, I'm a big fan of that. Um, but if you're vegetarian, you can go with the cashews, uh, yogurt, chickpeas as well. You can kind of see that on here. I think sesame seeds is a good source as well, I believe. Um, and then vitamin D. So vitamin D is going to be your nutrient or rather vitamin that is has the most evidence for it. You know, there is a lot of evidence for vitamin D now um, and how there's an association between normal levels of vitamin D and reduced risk of contracting uh, COVID, but also of reduced risk of severe illness with COVID. So, so vitamin D is very important for many things, including that vitamin D is actually, it, it actually has antimicrobial effects itself. So it's not just a vitamin, but it also has antimicrobial hormonal effects as well. So that's mainly what I want to say about that. Where do you get vitamin D from? So you can get it from different um, types of, of fish, um, milk, you know, fortified milk, things like that. Um, you can get it from uh, different eggs, depending on um, types of eggs and things like that. Um, certainly most people don't get enough vitamin D and I do find that most people I check in the clinic are low in vitamin D and often will supplement them with a little bit of vitamin D. So I think that's also pretty reasonable there. Vitamin A, you can see you can get that from different foods, mostly orange and green foods, uh, carrots, sweet potatoes, pumpkin, things like that. Fall is coming up as, as we speak in a, a month or two, I guess. Um, other things here, certainly eating fish, you know, can be really, really helpful. Uh, curcumin, which is the active ingredient of turmeric. So that's really great. Just make sure it doesn't stay in your counters. Uh, I've had that happen before. So, but really, really great. You can make some nice curries there, delicious foods and really, really helpful for you. Um, I like the sulforaphane here. That's anti-inflammatory. That's going to be a compound found in your cruciferous vegetables. You, have, you see the uh, cauliflower, the broccoli and things like that. So here's some integrated approaches to boost your immune system. I just listed that here. Um, and um, you know, there's many other things too that are non pigeon here. Certainly going back to lifestyle, 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 sleep, mindfulness, activity, which is the movement piece, the, the real food, and then your ties, and then getting out in nature is what I'd recommend as first line to help your immune system. So um, here's some other things that I, I, I won't go through, but it's basically kind of a summary of some of the things that we, we talked about here today. And so the take home points to optimize immunity. So we wanna build both immune system strength and tolerance, which are both critical aspects for a healthy immune system. You want your sort of quote unquote armed forces to be strong, but also flexible to, to, to have times when they kind of go at war with microbes, but also to create peace so that it's not at war all the time so that you don't get some cytokine storm, which is basically over inflammation. And then you also know that the most important lifestyle factors that you can do to modulate your own immune system to op optimize your immune system are those sleep, stress management, nutrition, activity, and cultivating those healthy relationships. So immune, the immune system health does not occur in isolation. No person is an island. It occurs in connection with ourselves, with others, with nature, and with spirit. And so that, with that, I'd like to open it up and I, appreciate you spending this evening with me here and thank you to Suburban Hospital and to Kate and Sarah for, for this opportunity to talk with you all of you today. Again, very inspiring and um, just wanted to say to all of you to stay say, safe and healthy and keep moving. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong. That was very informative. I certainly learned quite a bit. So thanks for your time. Thanks everybody who joined us today. Um, please feel free to pop any questions you have in the Q&A. I do have a few that were sent to me um, via email, but we do have one so far in the Q&A box. And that is, what, what, what is the role of organic fresh food? You mentioned non-GMO soy products only. Yes, absolutely. Organic fresh food is amazing. Um, you must eat 
organic fresh food. And I had something on the slide, but sorry if you didn't see that. It was talking about things like uh, fruits and vegetables and things that are in the periphery of your store. So you absolutely want to eat those fresh foods. Um, everyone has their favorites. I don't think anyone is necessarily better than another. It depends on what you're kind of looking for. And, um, you know, some people that we see have certain gut issues and they don't tolerate certain foods or they make them, you know, they make you bloated or something like that. So you have to kind of listen to your body a bit. I would say organic fresh food is, is really, really important. Um, you know, uh, fruits, you know, I would say berries are really important. Berries help to improve your blood vessel health and it, it helps with circulation. So blueberries, blackberries, things like that. They're antioxidant, they're anti-inflammatory. I really like fish, you know, like pasture-raised chicken, things like that. The cruciferous vegetables, like I said, we talked a lot about um, Hex Ferments, which is a company in Baltimore, but essentially a, a uh, sauerkraut, you know, company, I think, uh, but, you know, things like that. Fermented foods are really helpful. Yogurt, you know, if you like yogurt, kimchi, uh, what else is there? I'm not a really big fan of kombucha. That's just my own preference, but um, I think sauerkraut is a great one. You know, the tofu, yeah, tofu can be helpful in moderation, I think, um, and the mushrooms, you know, as well. So I hope that answers your question. Um, what else? Green leafy vegetables, dark leafy greens, really, really important. We didn't talk about that, but cabbage, you know, spinach, chard, you know, all these type of things, the salad greens. Actually, um, I didn't say this, but some research back from the 1970s actually showed that if you eat raw foods first before you cook foods, that reduces inflammation. So just like eating your salad before your main course, that, that can be really, really helpful for you. Thank you very much. Um, and our next question, a quick one. Repeat the company name in Baltimore. I think it was for the- Hex Ferments. Ferments. Yes, yes. I can attest, they are good. <laughs> <laughs> I think I saw them at a, I don't know. I think it might have been, it, it, it's either at a farmer's market or at one of the local organic grocery stores, something like that. Yeah, I'm a fan of the kimchi myself. The kimchi, okay. Um, yes. Um, so I have two questions that were sent to me. One of them was, um, you mentioned the heart math. Can you talk a little bit about what that is and how that contributes to immunity? Yes, yes. Uh, and, and we have a heart math specialist in our practice. And I think, I think the website is called heartmath.com. So you can go to that for more information because they can probably explain it better than I am. I, I can, but, but the heart and the brain sync up electrically. So have you ever gotten an EKG before? You know, you get the EKG, you put on your, the leads, you know, and things like that um, on the skin and it's measuring the electric activity of your heart. Well, you know, the heart actually communicates to your brain electrically too. And when the heart and brain are in electrical, electromagnetic coherence, then your nervous system is balanced, your immune system is strengthened. When, and this is feelings of peace and joy and happiness and calmness and you know, things like that. And it's not to say that these other difficult emotions are bad. Um, you know, things like sadness, you know, grief, um, loneliness, uh, what else, you know, more, uh, more of these type of emotions are also part of the full range of human experience. So we wanna have all these ranges. Um, when the heart and brain are not in coherence for a long period of time, this creates a chronic stressful situation in your body, which affects your immune system. So heart math is a technique that's scientifically validated from heart math Institute in California. There's over four, 1400 now, 1400 peer reviewed studies that are uh, in support of this kind of technique to kind of help with different things. It's been studied for hypertension, anxiety, depression, and general stress. So I think these are really uh, important tools. And, you know, another tool you can use. Now, I'm a data guy. I like data, <laughs> like apps. Uh, you know, not everyone's into that. But if you're into how balanced your nervous system is, if you want to use your intuition and say, yeah, I'm feeling great right now. I'm feeling balanced. You can totally do that. Some people like myself are also into, I want to see what the data is. I want to see how my heart, how coherent my heart is in my brain. You can actually get these apps now and download these apps that heart math has, I think you have to pay for it a little bit. But again, it's, you can actually do some breathing, you can do these heart math techniques and you can see how that coherence, how that balance in your nervous system changes over time with these mind-body practices. So I hope that helps a lot. Uh, but yeah, go to that site a bit. And um, you know, I think if you, if you want to try out, um, uh, I don't know if I, I can say, but I, we have a heart math instructor in our clinic. So, you know, she could probably talk with you too about stuff like that. Thank you. Good to know. Um, okay. Our next question is, is soy or tofu bad for women to eat? 
Um, I think that in moderation, it is really good. You know, soy has what's called a phytoestrogen response. So it will stimulate the estrogen receptor, receptors to some degree. And um, I think that in moderation, it is healthy. Um, I don't think it's a required food, but if you are using it for protein, if you're using it as a way to kind of get some healthy protein, I think, I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think you do want to do the, um, what's called the organic or non-GMO soy because there is a lot of glyphosate. There's a lot of what's called this, um, you know, pesticides and, and glyphosate, which is a weed killer, you know, on the soy a lot of times if it's conventionally grown. So that's actually really important to know because that would also stress out the immune system. Good to know. Um, thank you. Um, all right, our next question is, how important is organic compared to compared with whatever is on the shelf? Does the importance vary among different types of food? It absolutely does, yes. And I think especially if you're on a budget, you don't want to necessarily go all organic, but I think what you want to do is selectively pick the ones that you would uh, benefit most from. So there's actually a website called EWG, and I think it's www.ewg.org, Environmental Working Group. And they have something on their site that's very free. You can just Google it probably. Environmental Working Group Clean 15, and which are the 15 foods that are clean that if you bought that non-organic, it likely wouldn't have that many pesticides. And then there's something called the EWG Dirty Dozen. So the Dirty Dozen are the ones that, and they rank them sort of every year, you know. I don't know, it's almost like a yearly pageant or something. Like, which ones are the clean 15? <laughs> which one the dirty dozen? But they change slightly every year. But typically, you know, certain foods, like bananas are a good example. Bananas are usually in the clean 15 because they have thick skins. And so the pesticide or chemicals they use is not, they're, are not going to get inside the banana, you know. But something like a strawberry, which doesn't have any, like, skin over it, if they spray that, it's going to get right onto the strawberry. So that's using the dirty dozen. That's just an example. So you can use those lists of EWG, Clean 15, and Dirty Dozen to kind of understand which foods might be more, what might give you the biggest bang for your buck in terms of buying more cleanly, you know. Um, I think in terms of nutrient status, I, I think there's not a clear answer to that in terms of are organic foods more nutritious, you know. In other words, do they have more vitamins? I don't think that's really proven or not. I think what is shown is that they definitely have less pesticides though, so which is a good thing. Good to know. I've bookmarked that website to <laughs> later, so thanks um, for also, sharing that. Also, I, just to plug for that website, that website has a great site called Skin Deep. If anyone's into shampoos and cosmetics and sunscreens, the Skin Deep site's gonna rate those and which, uh, uh, skin care and hair, hair care and stuff has, um, has environmentally unfriendly chemicals in it, you know, unhealthy chemicals for you versus the more natural things that are going to be better for your body. So that, that's a really nice site. And you, you might be pleasantly or unpleasantly surprised depending on <laughs> what you're using, you know, but, <laughs> but the skin deep is really good because if you think about food, you know, we're eating food, we're taking in food through our mouth, but our skin is also an organ that we nourish our skin through and the lotions we put on is also going to be a nourishment too. So you got to give your skin some good food as well. Just a little tangent Thank there. Thank you. I have yes. written that one down too. Um, our next question is, does burning of the tongue, is it due to B vitamin deficiency? Um, yes, it can be. I think there's different things that can cause burning of the tongue. I know that sometimes people can have burning of the tongue after viruses, I think too. But B vitamin deficiency, I think zinc may be part of that too. It's not so clear that it's only B vitamins, but it definitely could be one of the reasons, yes. Okay, and I have one more question and it might be, the preface, it might be a little hefty, um, but if you suffer from chronic depression, how does that affect immunity, especially with different medications you may be on? Um, well, A, you wanna see your doctor for that, you know, see your, whether it's your, primary care doctor, a mental health professional. Um, can you repeat that question? I, I don't know if I got the whole thing. Uh, something about depression and immunity. And immunity and mm -hmm. um, it's a chronic stress and inflammation and how that affects immunity. Yes, um, this is a really great question. Thank you for answering, asking that, whoever is asking that. Um, in the depression, when you look at studies of the brain and you look at people that are depressed and depression is associated with inflammation of the brain. So in a root cause perspective, 
depression, yes, there's some neuro neurotransmitter imbalances like serotonin and dopamine and things like that. And you're going to feel sad and things like that. First of all, get help. Really, really important to do that. See your doctor for that. See your see your therapist, you know, see your mental health professional, psychiatrist, et cetera. Get help, really, really important. Um, I know that for people with severe depression, Suburban has an outpatient program. So I just want to preface that. Um, vitamins alone for depression, I, I, I want to make sure people get the medical care too. Um, but depression being brain inflammation, I know that brain inflammation, how do you reduce brain, infl you know, how do you reduce brain inflammation? So um, yes, depression, I think is associated with immune uh, weakness or immune um, imbalances. So you do want to get that mental health treated if that was the question. Um, but along the lines of brain inflammation, one of the things I've found to be helpful is yes, eating more fruits and vegetables, eating more of those uh, fresh organic produce, like I think uh, someone was saying there, the berries, the, the turmeric, you know, the greens, like things like that. The protein, you need protein to actually make the building blocks for the neurotransmitters. So you need all, you need the healthy fats. Um, so I do think about nutrition a lot for, um, for depression. Um, you have to think about, you know, but uh, just to get off on a tangent there. Yeah. So depression, I think you need a comprehensive approach. You need a really integrative approach there, I think, for depression. Um, but yes, it does affect your immune system. So you absolutely, and it's as important as physical health. The mental health, physical health are equally important. And so we can talk about sleep and movement and nutrition, but mental health must be treated for, to, for you to have optimal immune health. Thank you. And I know we could probably talk a lot on that. <laughs> so thanks for touching on that. Thank you. Um, okay. I think we have time for one more question. And that is, um, what about waking after three or four hours of sleep and not being able to go back to sleep? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, um, not really great for immune system, but are you saying that you're having trouble getting back to sleep essentially? I mean, and then you have to figure out why you're having trouble. Is it pain? Is it urination? Is it reflux? Is it sleep apnea? Like what, what is going on with that? Is it um, thoughts that are racing, you know, in your head? Cause sometimes that could happen thinking of too much stuff. Um, you know, it depends on what the cause is, you know, trying to, fi trying to find out what the trigger was, you know, for you and then trying to address that really. Um, you know, I know some people take sleeping pills. I know people take over the counter things, Benadryl, things like that. You know, those things are great short term. I think those things are good to get a good night's sleep, a little bit more sleep, kind of knock you out a little bit. Not really great long term for the brain, though. You know, if you have to take them long term, not really great for the deep sleep, which is what you really need to get re uh, restoration. Um, so you might want to, um, I mean, there's different ways to answer this question, but I would say you definitely have to think about is there anxiety? You know, if there's anxiety, then you can think about what's called low GABA aminobutyric acid or GABA, GABA. And there's certain things that are going to be helping GABA, things like magnesium or valerian. Or um, I know one thing that can be really helpful is something called lemon balm tea. These things will increase the GABA activity in the brain, which is going to calm the brain down. If you're having trouble with feeling wired, so you're tired and you can't fall back asleep, but you, but you feel wired, you know what I mean? Like you're your, your energy is really high, then that's probably more of a cortisol adrenaline thing. And then again, you have to actually think about what's happening during the day for you because the daytime activity affects your nighttime sleep. So whatever's happening during the day will often carry over 12 hours later. You have a stressful day at work, stressful day at home, try to resolve that by the time you get to bed so that it doesn't carry over into your nighttime sleep. Good advice, thank you. Um, okay, well, I think that completes our 20, uh, 2021 annual Lunch and Learn for Senior Shape, and I'm so glad we can keep this tradition alive with our members, and Dr. Wong, thank you for being here with us and sharing your expertise and knowledge. Um, really, thank you. It was a lot, a lot of great information and good health advice, and very timely as we continue to navigate through um, the pandemic. Um, so I will leave everybody, ha hope everyone have a great rest of your evening. Uh, thanks again for joining us and um, please fill out that evaluation that should show up after um, we hit end. And um, yeah, thank you. Get a good night's sleep and remember to eat your fresh, fresh, uh, fresh food. So thank you. All. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Hey, thank you, Dr. Wong. Stay healthy, everyone. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to end it now. Okay.
think this will just cut us off. So have okay. a good evening. <laughs>